In this video, I'm going to be discussing all of those really annoying genetics terms that you've probably not taken any time to memorize because you're hoping they don't actually show up on your exam. Before I get started, please remember that in the description of all of my videos, you'll find a link to my Patreon page. By clicking that link, it'll take you off of YouTube and onto Patreon. Patreon is a platform where you can sign up to send a secure monthly donation to support my channel. So if you like the videos that I'm making and you appreciate the free medical content and you want to give back in some way, your financial support is greatly, greatly appreciated. It'll allow you to send any amount in a monthly donation that you want, ranging from $1 to $1 gazillion. Again, I truly, truly appreciate any financial support that you can provide. But despite that, I will continue to provide these videos totally for free on YouTube, available worldwide. Now let's get into today's video. Today's video is on those really annoying genetics terms. Genetics is unfortunately quite high yield for USMLE and Comlex. And when I say genetics terms, I'm referring to this laundry list of really annoying terms. I know that you're sitting there and you're having post-traumatic stress disorder flashing back to the first two years of medical school or maybe even college when you had to go through this list and memorize what these terms refer to. Now for the purposes of USMLE and Comlex, you need to not only understand these terms, but you need to know examples of these terms. The way that this is going to probably present itself on your exam is not going to be the actual black or white definition of the term, but they might give you an example of one of these things clinically and then ask you which term that example refers to. So my goal in this video is to go through this list one at a time and when I'm talking about an individual term, I'll give you a clinical example that might show up on your exam. So let's just get started and dive right in. We're going to start with codominance. So codominance refers to when both allele copies are expressed. So in codominance, neither of the alleles are recessive and neither of them will mask the other one. Classically, when you think about different alleles, you know you have the dominant and the recessive one. And typically, one is going to be expressed phenotypically. But in codominance, that's not the case. Both allele copies are expressed. The very high yield clinical example of this is the ABO blood type. And as you can see, if somebody, for example, is blood type AB, neither A nor B is recessive. They're codominant, so both are expressed. This is the example that will probably show up on USMLE or Comlex if they want you to answer a question about codominance. So all you need to take away from this slide is that neither allele is recessive and both are expressed. The example is the AB blood type, and that's codominance. That's all you need to know. Let's talk about variable expression. Variable expression, which is AKA also known as expressivity, refers to a situation where people have the same disease genotype, but different symptoms. So think about the name here, variable expression. The expression or the symptoms of the disease are variable. So let's talk about some high yield clinical examples. The two most obvious clinical examples that could show up are Marfan syndrome and neurofibromatosis type one. So in Marfan syndrome, there are lots of different people with Marfan syndrome, right? They all have the same disease genotype. However, they all show different levels of connective tissue involvement, and that's variable expression. So the expression of the same disease genotype is variable because some people have more problems with their connective tissue than others. The same is true of neurofibromatosis type one. Just because you have neurofibromatosis type one, AKA you have the same disease genotype, different people have different amounts and different severity of the neurofibromas on their skin. So someone might have them all over their back and someone might have only a few on their back. The takeaway from this slide is that the expression is variable. The expression of the symptoms is variable even though multiple different people can have the same disease genotype. So that's variable expression also known as expressivity. So now we're done too. Let's keep this rolling. The next term we're going to talk about is incomplete penetrance. So incomplete penetrance refers to a situation where somebody does have the diseased allele, but they do not express the trait that that allele can 
lead to. And the most high yield clinical example of this is the BRCA1 mutation. So just because you have the BRCA1 mutation does not necessarily mean you're going to 100% develop breast cancer. Is there a high likelihood or a high chance of that happening? Absolutely, but it's not guaranteed. So incomplete penetrance is the situation where you do have the disease allele. In this case, you have BRCA1, but not necessarily the expressed trait i.e. not necessarily the expressed breast cancer disease, okay? So incomplete penetrance, the penetrance of the diseased allele is incomplete. It hasn't completely gone through and conferred itself as the disease. So that's the high yield example of incomplete penetrance. The only other thing that I want you to take away from this slide is that rarely the test writers will ask you to calculate what's known as penetrance. It's very annoying, but it's actually quite simple. Penetrance refers to uh, basically a ratio. It's the number of people with symptoms divided by the number of people with the diseased genotype. And this will estimate for you the penetrance of a certain disease. So in this case, if we're gonna simplify this heavily, but if one person had symptoms, but 10 people had the disease genotype, so only one person had breast cancer, but 10 people had broke a one, then the penetrance would be one over 10 or 0.1. So you can calculate those things on your exam. And I understand that's annoying, but if you think about this calculation, it, it, it is somewhat intuitive. So takeaway summary from this slide is that incomplete penetrance is the situation where somebody does have the disease allele, but does not express the trait that that allele can code for. That's incomplete penetrance. Now let's talk about pleiotropy. So pleiotropy refers to one gene affecting multiple phenotypic traits. And a really beautiful example of this is PKU, phenylketonuria. So PKU is the one gene, right? The one diseased allele. And of course, PKU comes as a disease from a diseased allele. And it gives rise to multiple phenotypic traits, right? There's not only one symptom of PKU. You see things like hypopigmentation, intellectual disability, et cetera, et cetera. So when you have a disease that has, it, that has more than one phenotypic derivative of that disease, that is pleiotropy. So very easy to understand. Any disease with multiple symptoms basically is pleiotropic. All right, the next term that we need to talk about is genetic anticipation, sometimes referred to simply as anticipation. Anticipation refers to the process by which there is an increased severity and decreased age of onset of the disease in subsequent generations. So the way that this will, will show up on your exam is they'll describe a disease in one generation and then they'll say that you know the patient's son or the patient's grandson has the same symptoms that are more severe and they're occurring earlier in life, also known as decreased age of onset. The classic, classic, classic clinical example of this is Huntington's disease with that CAG trinucleotide repeat expansion because in subsequent generations, that trinucleotide can expand faster, which means you're going to get that disease at a younger age and you're going to get that disease with way more severe symptoms. Now, this is true of all trinucleotide repeat diseases, but for some reason, the classic example that shows up on USMLE and Comlex is Huntington's disease, which if you recall, the trinucleotide repeat in Huntington's disease is CAG. See my video on trinucleotide repeats if you need some ways to remember that, but just to briefly refresh your memory, CAG stands for can't aim great. Hunters for Huntington's can't aim great if they have Huntington's disease. So that's genetic anticipation. Summary takeaway from this slide is an increased severity and decreased age of onset. Usually on your test, you'll get it because they'll tell you that the subsequent generation gets it at age 25 when the patient's father or grandfather got it at age 45. So that's the anticipation. We've only got two terms left. You guys are doing a really great job. Let's talk next about locus heterogeneity. So locus heterogeneity is, is actually pretty simple. It's the process by which different loci or different mutations all cause the same phenotype. So let me give you a really simple example. So let's imagine for a second that we've got three different people with three different diseases. One person has homocystinuria, one person has multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2B, and one person has Marfan syndrome. Now, as you know, because you've been studying for USMLE and Comlex, these are three very distinct diseases with different genetic 
components to them. They occur on different chromosomes. They're completely different diseases. That's what I'm trying to say here. But despite that, all three of these very distinct different diseases all cause the same phenotype, which is to say that they all give rise to the symptom of a morphinoid body habitus. That is locus heterogeneity, when three completely different gene loci, mutations, diseases, cause one common phenotype. That's it. That's all I want you to know. Now look at the name of this disease, right? Or this term, excuse me, locus heterogeneity. So you have heterogeneity on different locus or different loci. So it's somewhat easy to remember. Let's wrap up by talking about heteroplasmy. Heteroplasmy is the most confusing term of this entire list, but I think if I go through this, you'll, you'll be just fine. Heteroplasmy refers to there being one or more type of mitochondrial DNA that accounts for a variable expression of mitochondrial disease. Okay, so this sounds like a lot. Let me break this down for you. So heteroplasmy itself is one or more type of mitochondrial DNA. And because there's one or more types of mitochondrial DNA, you get variable expression of mitochondrial disease. So this term is somewhat confusing because within this term, we've got another term, right? We've already talked about what variable expression is. The expression of the disease is variable. Now, heteroplasmy in particular means that you have one or more types of mitochondrial DNA that then causes variable expression. And that DNA can both be normal and mutated. So this only refers to things that are within the realm of mitochondrial DNA diseases. And the classic example is myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers, also known as MRF. So in patients with MRF, some of them are pretty normal, right? You don't immediately know from an early age that these patients have MRF. But in others, the, the symptoms are so severe that they do have MRF and that gets diagnosed pretty early. The reason that there's a difference between those people that don't have it that badly and the people that have the really severe symptoms is variable expression, which we've already talked about on a previous slide. So there's variable expression of mitochondrial disease, but where that comes from is the heteroplasmy of the mitochondrial DNA. So because some of the mitochondrial DNA is normal and some of the mitochondrial DNA is abnormal, which is to say that that mitochondrial DNA exhibits heteroplasmy, you therefore get variable expression of mitochondrial disease. And this happens in patients with MRF. So a little complex because there's two different terms, both present when we have to have this discussion about heteroplasmy. But I think if you rewind the video and just listen again to what I said, heteroplasmy is the fact that there's normal and mutated DNA. Therefore, there's variable expression of mitochondrial disease, as is the case when you look at patients with MRF. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. You now know all of the really annoying genetic terms that are very high yield and are bound to show up on either your practice questions or possibly even USMLE or Comlex. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a like, drop me a comment. Please remember to check out my Patreon page, which can be found in the description of every single video. Your support is greatly appreciated. Good luck.